Hey, biology class. Uh, welcome to our first set of notes here for chapter 14. We spent a lot of time talking about DNA, chromosomes, uh, dominance, simple recessive kind of stuff with Mendelian genetics and rules. Now we're going to take a, a real short chapter here and apply it to humans. And, uh, and it is pretty interesting. A lot of the examples you're going to see this chapter are kind of sad because I wish I could tell you that these mutations uh, were giving us all sorts of cool, you know, adaptations and superpowers like the X-Men or something along those lines. Um, but in reality, it's just a, it's a real big chapter on disease <laughs> and disorders. So uh, that's a little sad, but, but it, is, it is application. So let's jump right into it. Uh, your book starts talking with shades of skin, and it has a really cool graph at the end of your chapter uh, where the questions are. Mapping out uh, how much light the native population skin reflects compared to how much light their habitat receives from the sun. And what they found was really a great correlation, not to spoil it for you, that the darkest skinned people were in the sunniest places. Uh, and the lightest skin is people, lightest, <laughs> that's hard to say, lightest skinned people were in the less sunny places. So of course, Northern Europe had very light skinned people and very little sunlight and uh, Australia and Kenya had a ton of sunlight and very dark native people. And so we had some really, uh, a really strong correlation there. And the idea is that perhaps these variations uh, evolved over time as a balance between their vitamin D production and their UV protection. Uh, lots of melanin, you get protected from the UV, but you don't make as much vitamin D. Uh, very little melanin, you make lots of vitamin D, but you have little protection from the sunlight. So depending on where you live, it is beneficial to you to be very dark or very light. So more than 100 genes in their products are involved in the synthesis of melanin and the formation and deposition of these melanosomes. So 100 gene products, that's a lot of different genes and gene products that are regulating exactly how dark you are. And mutations in some of these genes might have contributed to these regional variations in human skin color. This is a picture in your book I really like. I get a kick out of this picture because my kids are in, in class, they're always using these words black and white. You know, is somebody black or is somebody white? And I say, ah, oh, you know, it's all variations in melanin, so it's kind of hard to say that. And I had two students after class one day, and I asked the two students, you look at this graph right here, showed them this picture. I said, you tell me where white stops and black begins. <laughs> and it couldn't have been better. One kid goes, oh, right here. Everybody up from there is black, everybody down from there is white. The next student, a second later, points right here and goes, everybody up here is black, everybody down here is white. And of course, that's... <laughs> That's exactly proving my point. It's ridiculous. It's variation in melanin production and expression, and it's continuously variable. You have lots of melanin expression, little melanin expression, and then a pretty good sized middle ground of melanin expression. <clears throat> so using these terms like black and white, they might work for like radio shows and stuff like that. Uh, but when it comes down to biology, that really gets pretty tricky. Here's an example of two people who had, <clears throat> let's think here, um, European descent mom and African-American dad. Does that kind of make sense? So she had a European descent mom and an African-American dad, European descent mom, African-American dad. And so for today's terms, these kids would use like half black, half white kind of thing, I guess would work. And here are their twin daughters. And one daughter has received sets of genes that have coded for a little more melanin expression. And this daughter over here has received sets of genes which have um, coded for a little less melanin expression. And so you get a brown haired, dark eyed girl and her twin sister, a very nearly blonde haired, blue eyed girl. And of course my kids in anatomy and these other classes would be like, they had one black baby and one white baby. This is great. No, they didn't. They had two different daughters who expressed different alleles for melanin production. So take that as you will. Um, it's continuously variable, just like so many other traits. So humans live under variable conditions. Uh, we select our own mates and we produce if and when desired. So it makes studying genetics for us very difficult because we're not like fruit flies. You can't just pick a mate, have a hundred kids and figure out their genetics. 
Humans don't work like that. They take a long time to reproduce and they choose their mate. So it gets really tough. When you want to study human genetics, it's a lot more difficult than lab animals. And so we generally have to track these observable traits over generations. And we call that a pedigree. You can do pedigrees with dogs, horses, humans, whatever. But it's a chart of genetic connections that we use to try to determine the probability that future offspring will be affected by a genetic abnormality or disorder. And so it's basically a big chart that maps out males and females and what their phenotypes look like. And it reveals whether a trait's associated with dominant or recessive alleles and whether the allele's on an autosome or a sex chromosome. That was the bell. I'm out of time. I will show you a pedigree in class and it is a good thing to be familiar with and practice because I'm sure you'll see it again. So thanks for your time.